afternoon to you all. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the Digital Futures Group here at the Institute of International and European Affairs. You're very welcome to the Institute's webinar on SHREMS II and the EU US Privacy Shield, the European Court of Justice Rules the World, with Cameron Kerry, the Anne Orr and hey, Andrew H. Tisch Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. Cameron, as you know, you previously addressed us here in the IIEA back, would you believe, in 2012, which is a long time ago, and in different circumstances when you worked in the U.S. Department of Commerce. So you're very welcome, and we're really, really happy to have you back here again. Um, I have to say you have a great title for your presentation. And as we know, you're a global thought leader on privacy and data transfers issues. So we're really looking forward to your presentation. The programme today is as follows. Uh, Cameron will speak for 25 minutes, 30 minutes or so. And then we will go on to questions with you, the audience. And Cameron's presentation and the Q&A uh, will be on the record. You can send in your comments or questions, and that would be good maybe during the presentation, uh, through the question and answers function that at the bottom of your screen. I'd really appreciate if you put your name and affiliation when you ask a question. Please also feel free to use Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at IIEA. Cameron, your presentation today is timely and important. The Shrimps 2 judgment of July, just July this year, by the Court of Justice of the European Union invalidated the EU-US Privacy Shield framework, which had been established to ensure the personal data transfers from the EU to the US could comply with EU law. On Monday last, Facebook filed High Court papers challenging the Data Protection Commissioner here in Ireland, Helen Dixon's preliminary order to stop data transfers. There's been a lot of debate about that, of course, and some commentators have asked the question, are we close to a major breakdown on how the internet works and who is allowed to send what and to whom? And by that, I mean normal services, even like social media or even online shopping. Cameron, I know you'll explore the implications for data transfer mechanism between the EU and other partners. So we're very honoured to have you back again here at the IIEA today. Cameron served as General Counsel and as Acting Secretary of the US Department of Commerce. He also led the Obama administration work on privacy and the engagement with the EU. As a lawyer, he uh, wrote the definitive analysis of the Court of Justice of the European Union on Schrems II decision. He is currently the Anne and Andrew Tisch Distinguished Visiting Fellow at Brookings Institution in Washington, where he focuses work on privacy, technology, and their interaction with transatlantic relations. You're very welcome, Cameron, and the screen is yours. Um, Joyce, thank you very much. And it's, uh, uh, it's good to be back, uh, virtually uh, at least. Um, and when I was in Dublin uh, in uh, 2012, uh, it was during the Irish presidency of, of the European Council in the consideration of, of GDPR. Uh, nice. and, and, you know, that, that uh, visit and meetings uh, there was a part of what's been ongoing involvement uh, for me with, with the GDPR. Uh, as a government official, as a practicing lawyer, and now uh, at a think tank, and you know, began at the drafting stage and has continued through the legislative process, the Snowden uh, reaction, uh, uh, the implementation of GDPR, and of course the decisions uh, uh, involving uh, both the safe harbor framework and and now uh, privacy shield. Um, and I did do uh, that analysis that, that you talked about uh, um, and also acted in the general court uh, of the Court of Justice and litigation on the privacy shield. 
Uh, of course, the outcome of that litigation was uh, the Schrems judgment uh, in July. So let me offer some observations on that judgment so, uh, and talk uh, a little bit about what, what comes next. Um, let me say at the outset that I, I come to these issues as, as somebody who's linked to the European experience. I spent much of my childhood in post-war Europe because my father was an American diplomat stationed there. And many of my close relatives are in Europe because my, my mother was one of 11 children of a family of Americans who left Boston uh, to live in England and in France. Uh, she lived in Paris at the beginning of World War II and she was among the refugees who poured out of the city in front of the invading Nazis. The sister that she lived with uh, was interned by the Vichy government for harboring refugees and combatants uh, and Jews. The home that my grandparents uh, established in Brittany uh, was destroyed by the, the Germans uh, during the, the Battle of Saint Malo. And the brother and sister of my father's mother were transported from Vienna to the Theresen concentration camp, uh, where one died, the other was shift off, shipped off to Trulinka. And at the age of four, I lived in an allied occupied uh, Berlin that was still scarred by you know, bombed out, uh, bombed out and burned and shot up buildings. Uh, um, and you know, in Berlin and later in Norway, my family was stationed on the edges of the Iron Curtain. So I bear some of the imprints, uh, I think, that have affected uh, the European understanding of privacy and data protection. And I think sometimes it seems as though the US and Europe uh, are divided when it comes to privacy. Uh, certainly, uh, it seems like that uh, with uh, the Schrems II decision. But you know, I think uh, a lot of this perception comes from cognitive dissonance on both sides, stemming from differences in our legal systems and, and in ways of thinking about law. Uh, Ireland, of course, spans both sides of this gap. Uh, it's a common law country now, the only one in, in the EU, uh, but it operates under EU, so EU's civil law system. Um, and you know, like America, it's imprints on privacy and on civil liberty are really rooted more in uh, our revolts against the British crown than uh, on totalitarian systems. And I see the CJU's Schrems II judgment as a sorry, very much a product of civil law system and is reasoned deductively from the words uh, uh, in principles of the EU charter. Um, and the decision takes the EU's exceptionalism uh, uh, as it regards data protection to a new level. It overrides uh, the balance that the European Commission struck with the EU's interest in sustaining what is uh, the Union's most important trading relationship and recognizing sovereign interests of the United States and in accommodating differences between American and European legal systems. Um, at the end of the day, the decision, the CU's, CJU's decision, raises doubts about the ability of any company doing business in Europe to transfer data outside the European Union um, and could result in a form of soft data localization that you know, could validate policies in, in China, um, uh, Russia, and other countries that, that you know, require data localization. Um, it certainly sets a high bar 
uh, for any new arrangement uh, between the US and the EU, but also uh, for data transfers to other EU trading partners. As regulators and companies apply the decision, transfers to some countries and in some circumstances are gonna continue, but I think some will be deemed too risky and you know, leading uh, companies uh, or regulators uh, to keep data within the EU. And if there was any question about uh, those implications, uh, they certainly should have been erased by the news of, of the Data Protection Commissioner's uh, uh, preliminary decision. Uh, the case is about Facebook, but it could apply to any uh, company. Um, Commissioner Dixon is certainly uh, forcing the issue um, and setting it on a path to the, the European Data Protection Board um, and probably through one process or another uh, back to uh, the Court of Justice. I am, you know, one of the, the striking things about this decision and the its predecessor and others in the court's juris, jurisprudence is that although its authority over member states on national security is limited by, by the charter, by the, uh, the Treaty on the Foundation of the EU, um, it has much more leverage over the United States uh, because of the adequacy requirement in the GDPR. Um, and the prominence of US technology brands uh, and the scale of surveillance make it uh, an attractive target. Uh, attractive target uh, or perhaps a whipping boy. Um, in the decision, rather than look holistically at uh, an extensive record on US surveillance law and safeguards and practices developed in the, the Irish High Court case, uh, the ruling that the, you know, the, the scope of, of US surveillance and the judicial remedies available go beyond what's necessary in a democratic state uh, was based uh, principally on concessions that the commission made in its adequacy decision without really considering the totality of safeguards or differences uh, with the, in the US legal system and you know, the way that our law incorporates um, regulations, uh, um, executive orders and you know, other subsidiary law. Um, and in the first Schrems decision, the court took pains to say that the essentially equivalent standard for adequacy does not mean a level of protection uh, identical to that guaranteed in the legal order. But in the privacy decision, uh, it framed adequacy as compliance with the provisions of the charter. Uh, certainly the decision creates distinct problems for the US. Um, you know, some 5,300 US and European countries uh, used the privacy shield for, for transatlantic uh, data transfers. Um, many of those also relied on the other mechanism in the C addressed in the judgment, which are the standard contractual clauses that the EU propounded to um, you know, enable transfers of data to countries where there are no adequacy decisions. Um, the contractual clauses too are in doubt given the the obligation that the court declared for exporters of data and importers, uh, both to consider on a case-by-case -case basis, whether the third country laws um, uh, prevent compliance with the clauses uh, and to suspend or terminate data transfers, if so. Um, and also the obligations of supervisory authorities uh, to do the same. I'm um, sorry, with respect to the US, the rulings um, present an inescapable question whether 
compliance with those clauses are possible. And that is the question that Helen Dixon's preliminary decision presents. Um, but the US is not alone um, in uh, these questions. Uh, a great many EU companies are using uh, contract clauses to transfer data uh, all over the world. That includes countries like China, Russia, and India that have extensive surveillance programs. And controllers are now obligated to consider if this surveillance limits their ability to comply uh, with fundamental rights. So the Commission will revise the clauses. Uh, the European Data Protection Board will provide uh, more guidance on the additional safeguards that, that the GDPR and the court's decision allow in principle uh, for countries without adequacy. But the extent to which the, the contract clauses or other mechanisms like binding corporate rules allow existing data flows is still up in the air um, and ultimately is going to depend on the risk tolerance the pragmatism of data controllers, the commission, the DPAs, um, and eventually uh, the court of justice. Um, the decision also creates uncertainty for many of the EU's trading partners. Uh, these include countries that have uh, existing uh, adequacy determinations um, and also uh, know, both uh, South Korea and the UK, which are seeking uh, adequacy determinations. And those reviews are going to require the same scrutiny uh, of intelligence programs uh, that the US has had. Um, as the CJU has become increasingly firm in its direction on uh, data protection and an application of charter principles, um, it's become, I think, increasingly theoretical and detached in its decisions. Um, given all of the certain uncertainties about the viability of data transfers that I talked about, it's absurd for the court to say, as it says in its final paragraph, that you know, uh, giving the decision immediate effect is not liable to create a legal vacuum. Now, on July 15, the day before the decision, 5,300 companies were in compliance and relied on the privacy shield uh, to transfer data to the US. Uh, in the afternoon of July 16, they had no legal basis for transfers. Um, and you know, the alternatives are contractual clauses. How viable are contractual clauses uh, when they need to be revised, when they're subject to difficult questions about foreign law? Um, you know, this is an impossible burden for companies, even for supervisory authorities. You know, at this point, hundreds of pages of high court testimony, uh, opinions from, from you know, the data protection supervisor and others, uh, submissions for the privacy shield decision, and legal argument before the CJEU went into explaining US law, how can any data exporter uh, possibly achieve any small fraction of that understanding. Um, and uh, is any data exporter in China or Russia really gonna say that, that their government's intelligence collection inhibits compliance with, with standard clauses? Um, under the GDPR, um, Standard contracts apply in the adequacy in the absence of an adequacy determination, um, and it's the commission that makes those determinations. But the decision, you know, quite explicitly injects the adequacy requirement uh, into almost all data transfers uh, to all countries in the world, and it puts that decision in the hands of data exporters in the first instance, um, uh, and then uh, supervisory authorities. So it's certainly tempting uh, to say that the CJU got it wrong. Um, it's tempting 
but it is uh, ultimately futile. Um, as a U.S. Supreme Court justice uh, famously said about, about his court, um, we are infallible because we're final. Um, the CJU has spoken. The EU, the U.S., uh, and the companies that transfer personal data across the Atlantic, around the world, now have to deal with it. So let me talk a little bit about uh, how I think the U.S. needs to deal with it. Now, arriving at something that will satisfy the CJU is going to be complicated. Um, and neither the commission nor the U.S. can afford to lose a third case. Um, in American baseball, uh, the rule is three strikes and you're out. So both sides need to sustain uh, transatlantic flows because you know they are so important to uh, economies that comprise nearly half of the world's GDP, and they are the most digitally interconnected regions of the world. Um, revised contracts, additional legal and technical and organizational safeguards of the kinds being considered um, may enable some transfers, but I think some will require uh, a new US-EU framework. Uh, and I think it will take US legislation uh, to achieve the robust uh, and stable framework uh, that's needed. So as I mentioned, the US has an array of safeguards over surveillance, which have been adopted uh, uh, you know, over decades uh, in response to past abuses. Um, and enlarged uh, after Snowden. Um, some are incorporated in the statute that authorizes surveillance of foreign communications. Um, others are in presidential orders governing intelligence agencies and various regulations uh, that govern law enforcement uh, and intelligence services. Um, these uh, originated uh, in the past decades to protect people within the U.S. Uh, and U.S. Uh, nationals everywhere. Uh, what we call U.S. persons uh, in, the, in national security law. But President Obama's uh, presidential policy directive 28 uh, declared that all persons should be treated with dignity and respect regardless of their nationality uh, or where they might reside extending the protection of U.S. persons to people everywhere. Uh, this declaration established a new international norm. Uh, uh, as a group of uh, EU-based experts in a study funded by the EU and published by the uh, Oxford Internet Institute uh, found um, few, if any, countries offer the kinds of protections for foreign nationals subject to their intelligence gatherings that are now being demanded of the U.S. government. Uh, and the U.S. now serves as a baseline for foreign intelligence standards. So I believe we should reflect this leadership in our laws by codifying President Obama's order into law, explaining how safeguards uh, uh, for U.S. persons apply uh, elsewhere, and reflecting the the procedures that exist to limit collection use and sharing of intelligence information about individuals. And you know, that way, uh, through our laws, we can, in the words of our Declaration of Independence, let the facts be submitted to a candid world. I think addressing the CJU's concerns about judicial remedies is more complicated, both politically and substantively. But, I think it begins with differentiating between redress and judicial remedies, which the CJU conflated by talking about judicial review uh, to have access to personal data or obtain rectification or erasure of such a, uh, a data. Access and rectification is an, or redress is an independent right. Um, which the GDPR gives to data uh, data subjects. Um, 
and you know uh, their parallel rights um, uh, for government bodies. But in fact, you know, in most member states, individuals are not able to sue to gain access to files of them because of the need to uh, maintain secrecy in ongoing investigations, which uh, you know, the Court of Human Rights uh, um, in Strasbourg has recognized. And instead, typically an oversight body of some kind over investigates individual inquiries uh, uh, about surveillance and initiates uh, corrective action without disclosing whether surveillance take place, took, takes, has taken place. Um, and this is essentially the function that was performed by the ombuds person under the privacy shield um, in response to uh, the requirement for redress. Um, and I think it will be possible to uh, you know, put in place uh, a more um, independent uh, uh, you know, mechanism uh, with, with stronger powers. Um, access to a judicial remedy after that administrative process uh, or initiating a challenge on the lawfulness of surveillance uh, would certainly require legislation. Um, but this is a place where subsequent notification um, as exists um, in some European countries uh, can help. Um, I, you know, some EU member states, uh, not all, uh, have requirements to notify the subjects of surveillance some years after the investigation. Uh, that is similar to requirements that we have in the US under our wiretap laws and under evolving uh, law under applying our constitutional protection against unreasonable searches and seizures uh, in the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. So we have precedent for legislation on notification. And notification, in turn, would provide a concrete basis for standing to bring a court case. So I believe that this prior uh, court authorization, um, as well as standing for judicial review, uh, is something that should be subject to reciprocity, much as adequacy is. Uh, should be available only where foreign governments uh, extend equivalent rights to US persons. This would push other governments, the EU included, uh, to apply uh, the international norm the US has set and ensure that you know, we are not obligated to treat North Korea the same uh, as we would treat uh, uh, e the EU or other democratic countries. So, you know, let me wrap up by saying that, that you know, the America has a distinguished history with regard to privacy. Um, it's enshrined uh, in our Bill of Rights, in the protections of persons and houses uh, uh, and effects uh, thoughts of religious belief um, uh, and you know a due process clause that has come to embody you know, not just judicial process but disproportionate restrictions on individual freedom and dignity. Um, it was an American jurist, uh, uh, Louis D. Brandeis, who first framed uh, a common law right to privacy in 1890 our Fair Credit Reporting Act in 1970 was one of the first national privacy laws anywhere. So two decades into the 21st century, it's time to update surveillance laws that were written in the 20th. Uh, we are in a world today uh, where devices that can reveal everything about us are constantly connected to global networks and the power of surveillance is beyond anything that was imagined when the existing laws were adopted. Um, passage of national comprehensive uh, privacy legislation would help. 
Uh, that's a project that I led in the Obama administration and you know, unfinished business uh, today that I'm focused on. You know, we have a matrix of sectoral laws uh, covering health information and financial records, and student records, um, you know, many other specific applications. But our current approach leaves a lot of the explosion of data that we are, have experienced in uh, today's world um, uh, exposed. You know, it's, uh, um, and now allows companies to set their own rules uh, for what they collect, uh, what they use, uh, and who they share it with. I believe the United States needs to align itself with liberal democracies that treat privacy as a fundamental right and reassert that historical leadership, uh, reduce the differences between it uh, and the EU and the more than 100 countries that now have data protection laws. Um, I believe that we need to do that with a law that's consistent with our common law origins, our culture of entrepreneurship, our system of innovation by uh, iteration. And I believe that like-minded countries in the EU and elsewhere should keep in mind that no matter what uh, our differences uh, uh, may be, um, uh, what the differences are in our legal systems or our approaches to privacy and data protection. Uh, they pale when compared with our differences with China um, and you know, other authoritarian and repressive countries. So thank you for the opportunity to come back uh, today um, virtually. Um, I hope to have the opportunity to be there in person again. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cameron, for that very powerful presentation. I think um, framing them as, as you have uh, with your um, personal experiences growing up and that of your family, I thought was very powerful because it set down really, you know, an understanding perhaps of how you've managed to go through such a complex uh, you know, both legal and cultural systems and advocate very, very clearly for uh, looking again at, at, at where, we're, where we're at. I thought um, it was a very thoughtful and detailed analysis mm. because it allows us maybe to look the way forward. So um, I'm going to ask now for our questions uh, and look at them here. Uh, we have a number of them but we may go back to that point a little bit later. Um, the first question here then is from Seamus Allen from the Institute. And he's asked the question, the European Commissioner for Justice has stated that the European Commission will bring forward proposals to adjust how SCCs work by the end of the year. Do you mm -hmm. think it's possible to update SCCs to enable transatlantic data? Um, sorry, I just missed that, transatlantic data transfers while respecting Schrems II. Yeah, so as I indicated broadly in my, my remarks, uh, I think that process um, may enable some kinds of transfers. Um, I think there may, there may very well be some that are, are complicated. Um, uh, because of aspects of, of the court's ruling. Um, certainly some of the, the kinds of measures that people have talked about are uh, the use of strong encryption uh, for uh, data in transit and uh, data in storage. Um, uh, you know, interestingly, I mean, that is something that, you know, many of the larger companies have been doing for some years now. Um, uh, and, but, you know, there are many smaller companies uh, in that yeah. 5,300 privacy shield uh, companies that, that aren't necessarily, and, and of course, in the mass of other, uh, you know, non-U.S. transfers. Um, 
Uh, so that's you know, something that's, that's, that's being looked at. Um, I think for companies that receive uh, um, uh, uh, a process from the government to produce information, uh, there could be you know, an obligation in the contracts um, to resist that. Um, that's again an undertaking that a number of companies uh, have have made. And we'll recall there was the case uh, with Microsoft uh, uh, where the U.S. government was seeking data um, you know, on a server in in Ireland, um, and you know, Microsoft went uh, went to court on that. Um, so you know, sort of put those kinds of responses. Uh, uh, into law. I think some of this will depend, depend, as I said, on sort of what what the risk assessments are. Uh, risk assessment is something that some of the commission staff have talked about as something that they will try to build into um, uh, to contract clauses and into the analysis. Um, but you know, if you, for example, believe as that any encryption can be broken, um, uh, that might get you to a conclusion that encryption doesn't work, doesn't keep uh, the data out of the hands of the NSA. Um, uh, and you know, I think decryption is robust, but um, even the NSA can't decrypt all the traffic from all the world um, in any reasonable amount of time. So um, it's difficult to do. Uh, so they're practical uh, difficulties. Um, uh, you know, certainly uh, I think the commission has demonstrated political will to sort of look at things in a practical way. Um, I hope that members of the European Data Protection Board will. Um, uh, I have more doubts about the CJEU. Well, just, just this is another interesting question probably adds to the complexity which you, your, your presentation showed. It's a, a question from Deirdre Kilroy. And she asked the question, based on your work in the field of protecting consumers, what challenges do you perceive associated with the use of artificial intelligence, both in the US and in the EU? And how does that relate to the growing regulation of content to deal with online harm and attacks or attacks? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's a, there, there's a lot in there. Um, uh, look, I think the... Um, you know, AI affects privacy uh, principally in just sort of increasing the power of data, uh, data collection and data analysis um, uh, to make uh, you know, very granular inferences about individuals. So you know, that's... Um, uh, no, that's that has been on a continuum as um, you know as the volume of data that we each generate uh, has expanded as the collection and the analysis has expanded. Um, AI may present sort of a quantum leap in the ability to to analyze that, and one of the phenomena uh, that we've seen uh, that. Uh, you know, the GDPR addresses uh, uh, to a significant extent is, is that um, you know, some of the traditional mechanisms for um, separating uh, uh, identity and links to individuals from data um, become more and more difficult as, um, as you know, those inferences, the ability to draw links about individuals uh, increase. AI certainly uh, increases that. Um, the other danger, I think, that is 
that AI um, and the power of data um, can draw and, and the fact that uh, it is machine learning uh, uh, that's, that's uh, difficult to, to explain, difficult to, to reverse engineer. Um, uh, and you know, to some extent outside human control um, means that it might be possible to be used in prohibitive ways. Um, and I think you know, in the US, certainly now, as we talk about privacy legislation, um, the, the possibility that, that personal data can be used in ways uh, that discriminate to, uh, against individuals uh, has become a very important issue. I think you know, when uh, we enact uh, privacy legislation, it will certainly include protections uh, for civil rights, protections against discrimination, um, and some level of transparency uh, for, uh, for algorithms. Um, certainly those that, you know, in the terms of the GDPR have a significant uh, impact on individuals or other uh, significant legal, legal effects. Um, uh, and you know, I think that will be be an important step. I think the content issues uh, uh, are somewhat separate, but but certainly AI, uh, you know, as we're seeing you know, with, for example, election interference, um, you know, is is increasing the capacity of bad ac actors uh, to carry that out to you know create. Um, false information um, and increasingly sophisticated false information. Uh, I don't think we have the tools yet to deal with those issues. Um, uh, and of course, um, you know, we have the challenge in the U.S. Uh, that that you know, in many respects, uh, the U.S. values uh, free speech uh, in. Um, sort of above all other rights, much as I think the EU values uh, privacy and data protection above all other rights. Uh, um, and you know, so we, we definitely have a different balance uh, on those issues than the EU does and Europeans do. Mm. And I suppose that goes back to the mindset and the background, historical background as, as well uh, that you mentioned. You, you also mentioned that, you know, there was 5,300, is that right? Small mm -hmm. companies. So does it, uh, do you think that um, are larger companies better placed to respond to the CJU decision? You know, for instance, you know, by core challenges like Microsoft, you mentioned by building data centers in Europe, and will smaller companies and competition be harmed as a result? So are smaller companies really, because of the complexity of the, of the whole area, mm -hmm. are they really, yeah. you, you could say they can't really respond. You know, they're not in a position uh, to respond. Uh, I think my answer, Joyce, is yes, absolutely. I am, you know, the larger companies, uh, uh, have the capacity uh, to, uh, to to locate facilities in um, in other countries. Uh, you mentioned Microsoft; they have data centers in yeah. in Europe. Um, uh, so, uh, and then of course they have the the wherewithal to do that. Uh, a you know, an SME uh, that has been using uh, the uh, the privacy shield for, let's say, e-commerce uh, um, really doesn't have that option. Um, and neither do they have the ability, as I talked about, to do the analysis that's mm. required. Um, Quite that's complex, required on yeah. a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, you know, the big companies, um, uh, you know, because uh, they are 
recipients of many government access requests have staffs of lawyers who are national security lawyers who uh, respond to those. So, um, you know, they, they can do that analysis. They have security clearances, uh, mm. you know, but, but, you know, they are a small number in a class by themselves. A great bulk uh, of companies uh, do not have that capability, um, uh, and you know, neither do the great many European companies uh, that are transferring data and you know know nothing about U.S. law or Chinese mm. law or other uh, foreign laws. And yeah, and uh, as you know, the European Community and its you know digital policy di digital is at the center the green agenda and the di mm -hmm. digital agenda and you know they want small companies to use data more effectively in a whole array of areas because that is in a sense the new oil so do you think that is an argument in or, and and the, and the power of small companies do you think they have any power in this discussion or who do you think are the main actors in in the discussion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, is, is it around fundamental rights, individual rights, or is this, are this group of people, are they seen as important in this discussion? I don't know, do they have any yeah. way of articulating their concerns? Um, well, certainly, you know, those, those concerns are, are part of the political discussion. Um, but, you know, you look at uh, the the litigation in, uh, in the CJU, um, you know, I think there, there were some business associations uh, that appeared in the high court and therefore uh, the, the CJU case. Um, uh, I think you know, the, the Business Software Alliance, uh, uh, that's a primarily American but international uh, trade association. Uh, of technology companies, Business Europe, uh, which is a more broad-based association of European countries, uh, uh, which you know I'm sure uh, has the interests of SMEs involved, but you know most of them can't pay dues to Thank trade you, yeah. associations, so um, they, I'm sure they have less of a voice there. And there was nobody specifically at the table on those issues. Oh, that's um, yeah. Certainly, I think, you know, political leaders pay attention to course, yeah. those issues. Uh, you know, it's not off the radar in, in European Commission uh, thinking by any means. You mentioned earlier about, you know, separating identity and data. Is there a proportion of companies who, who relied on privacy issue that can turn to more creative use of data, such as depersonalizing data to enable transfers? Or is that just another layer of complexity? Mm -hmm. um, no, it's an important question. It is undoubtedly another uh, layer of complexity, but there's certainly uh, a lot of uh, research and development uh, being done these days in sort of various forms of privacy protecting technologies, um, such as, you know, federated databases that allow, uh, or federated, and, you know, federated databases or uses of data um, that, that, you know, allow data to remain um, in the hands of, of the original uh, uh, controller um, or, even of individuals, um, but allow effectively the algorithm to come to the data rather than the, the, you know, the, uh, the research to be require that the data go, go to another uh, computer. Okay. Um, and I think you know, there, that's uh, certainly promising for, for some applications. But again, I think that's a large scale thing. Um, uh, I am, you know, I'm also affiliated at MIT at the Media Lab, and the group that I work with is doing a lot of work 
on some of these these kinds of solutions. Uh, but my view has been that you know, because of the complexity, uh, that you know, getting them on a wide scale you know, where individuals or SMEs uh, can use them is requires you know a, in this well uh, a lot of time and development. I mean, this is really sort of super user uh, stuff. Stuff, uh, yeah. When it comes to, to you know the computation, the the methodology and the controls, mm -hmm. you know, I also think that that you know, um, and this is an issue as we talk about privacy legislation that you know, because of the complexity of managing data, um, managing our interactions with with data collection. Uh, um, you know, we really have to rely on normative laws like uh, grounds for processing uh, um, and and you know, proportionality in in the GDPR uh, to sort of establish boundaries for how the 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 data is used, how it's uh, uh, transferred. Uh, um, uh, how it's uh, how it's shared, um, and you know, in the scope of collection. So this is something I'm pushing for U.S. U.S. legislation. Uh, we have to set the boundaries. We can't rely on individuals to do the job of protecting their data. They should have the right to do that if they want it, but their privacy, their protection, should not depend on that. You, you, you know, you've mentioned there about the law and at the start of your presentation, you mentioned the difference between common law and civil law systems. Mm -hmm. So what role does the difference, do you think, between the two systems play? Is that the fundamental, is that a fundamental issue? Um, I don't know that it's fundamental, Joyce, but I, I do yeah. think that it is an important issue. Um, you know, I think it, it, as I'm talking about, I think it does affect the way that we think about things. You know, in, in, in a civil law system, uh, the, the visual analogy that I, I draw is that way. It's Napoleonic coat. It's sort of like the gardens of Versailles, this perfectly yes. ordered, rational universe that has, that flows from a central logic. Mm -hmm. uh, Common law system uh, is like the gardens of Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central yes. Park in New York and you know many other parks in the US where it's organic. There's there's no obvious uh, obvious organization awesome. to it. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think uh, sort of that framework. Um, Europeans look at uh, American law necessarily true with our sectoral system and privacy. I mm. think, you know, very uh, um, laws here and there and federal law and um, yes. different uh, levels, and, yeah. And different, uh, yeah, different, diff different levels. Um, and think that, you know, we have no law because we have yeah. no comprehensive privacy law. And I think Americans look at uh, sort of something like the GDPR and think, oh my God, it's just so, so prescriptive. Uh, yes, um, yeah. You know, what a thicket of, of regulation. And I think, you know, both of those, I think are, are extreme reactions, yes, but I think they do color something yes. like the CJU decision. Definitely. They're thinking. Um, I mean, particularly you know, I mentioned uh, the sort of various regulations that we have. The Advocate General opinion um dismissed all of that as well um you know internal regulations are not law okay but, yeah you know under our system they are oh. um uh, yeah. executive orders are binding on federal agencies uh, yeah. uh, so are our regulations so yeah. uh, I, yeah, I, there, I, I think it does make a difference the difference if i can maybe have a frivolous comment um on gardens um Wildflowers are all the thing now. There's no such question of having strict 
uh, and clear lines in uh -huh. your garden. You just let it all happen and the blossoms come forth. So that, that may, there may be a change coming, um, Cameron, there. Um, we have a question here from Dara Moriarty, and he's asking, um, or he's saying, many thanks again for a fascinating presentation. Wondering if you might, if you, if you feel you can now, when you hear it's coming, if you might be able to comment on any differences in approach between Trump and Biden when it comes to the matter of privacy and data protection or it is as one of the very few issues that unites uh, Democrats and Republicans? Um, so yeah, I think there, there, there are differences. Um, I mean, sir, uh, Biden has uh, said we should have a comprehensive privacy law in the United States. So that is probably the, the biggest difference. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, there will certainly be, I mean, look, at, um, uh, if Biden is president, he's going to pick up uh, the post privacy shield negotiations wherever they are and pursue a framework agreement. Uh, I recall that, you know, he, uh, he had a conversation with President Juncker uh, about, uh, uh, you know, about the safe harbor decision and getting to a new agreement then. So he's not a complete stranger to, to these okay. issues. I think Trump has rolled back some uh, privacy protections. Um, uh, you know, there was a Federal Communications Commission um, order that regulated um, internet service providers. Um, he signed the law that rolled that back. Um, more recently, they've lowered the fines for uh, violations of the, uh, the Healthcare Privacy oh, Act. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's some incremental things, uh, but you know, ultimately it comes that uh, there was in one of his agencies, the one that you know we used to be in, my uh, under my purview, um, I was looking into privacy policy and could you know an outcome of that could have been endorsement of uh, of privacy legislation. I think given you know, the, how close uh, members of Congress have gotten over the last couple of years, I think support from the administration could have made the difference. Mm. Um, so I'm hopeful that if Biden is president, it will make the difference and we will get to uh, a comprehensive privacy law in the next couple of years. Mm. Well, Cameron, unfortunately, our time is up, and it's good to end on that on that positive note of <laughs> Absolutely. the possibilities thank you. Of, of doing that. And I, I th thank you so much for such a stimulating and thoughtful presentation because you've raised very a lot of very key issues. But I think also you've you've brought hope and given kind of indications of how things could happen given that we, that we both need and want to make things happen in a way that's positive for our citizens, both in the US and the EU. So, so thank you so much for that um, and for being with us today. I hope we, you'll come back again to us, Cameron, um, mm, and, and hope hopefully so. at that stage, it'll be, it'll be uh, in person rather than virtual. And I'd like to thank um, to our audience uh, for your participation and for your questions. And interestingly enough, our, the next Digital Futures um, uh, event is on disinformation. As you've, mm. you've mentioned that mm -hmm. on the 2nd of October, Paolo Cicerini, who is the head of the Media Convergence and Social Media Unit in the, Uni in the European Commission, is speaking on countering online disinformation actions taken mm -hmm. and the challenges ahead. So that, that kind of links in with some mm -hmm. of the, the points that you, that you made. And I'd, I'd like to thank on our behalf, the production team here, Lorcan and Sarah and all the team for their skill and commitment. And to Seamus Allen, our digital policy researcher for all his work and uh, expertise that he's given us in supporting this webinar. But I'd like to leave with thanking you again, Cameron, because um, I think this has been an important event, an important presentation, because it's one that, that a solution needs to be worked on, needs to be found 
if in a world of technology where data is everything, we need to really think and work on it. And you've given us good grounds to do that. So thank you very much. And I say, look forward to seeing you again, Cameron. Thank you. Thank you.